watch broke last week, so I'm always nine minutes ahead forever. And I've lost You're right that. Am I good? We had a big tour of 35 Queens University students, environmental students, at the farm this morning. So. Fall. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm the miller here and also the farmer and the grower of the grain. Um, in 2010, which was the 200th anniversary of the mill, they did the restorations of the stones and called me looking for red fife, which would have been one of the period wheats that they grew, uh, dating from 1840, uh, David Fife Farm, just south of Peterborough. Um, and that's one of the wheats that I grew. And by sin of affiliation, they asked me if I wanted to learn how to mill, <laughs> which I did. So it's now eight years, I guess. It's the eighth year. Um, so we still grow red fife. Uh, we have a winter variety that we've grown, as well as a, a spring variety. It's a hard red spring wheat. So as far as wheats go, there's hard and soft wheat, there's red and white wheat, and there's spring and winter wheat. Uh, the red and white refer to the color of the brand, the anthocyanin layers. Um, the winter and spring is when we plant it, so the fall wheat has just gone in in the last week or so. Um, you see fields with little uh, one-inch stubbles, a lot of that's winter wheat. We tend to delay ours a little bit. Um, climate change is getting our fall a little bit later into December, and we don't want the grain to grow up too tall before it goes dormant. So we'll plant sort of first week of October maybe, so a delay of two weeks, two and a half weeks from what it was tradition. And the uh, spring wheats are planted in spring as soon as you can get on the field, which sometimes in the early days used to be frost seeding. So the second week of March, that last really heavy frost of the year where you, know, you go out at 3 o'clock in the morning and there's enough frost to hold the tractor up, and you seed it in and then that last free saw will be enough to bury the, bury the seed. And we've done that once or twice. It's a tough thing to pull off because there's one window and you've got to get it. Um, and then hard and soft refers to the protein content. And there's all sorts of permutations and combinations between those. But as a rule of thumb, hard red spring are your bread wheats, high protein, and your soft white winters are your baking wheats, cakes and cookies, uh, and they're the fall, fall ones. Um, there are durums, which are your pasta wheats. Uh, in terms of the uh, genetics of them, you've all heard of ancient grains probably. So those are old genetics. They date seven to 10,000 years ago. You know, your emmers, einkorns, spelts, and, and they are diploids. So all, all grains have seven chromosomes. Um, the diploid ones have two copies, just like we have 23 chromosomes, and we have two copies. The modern bread wheats have uh, six copies, so they're a hexaploid wheat. And a lot of that genetic diversity and redundancy gives the grain the ability to bioadapt to its local environments, pH, degree days, diseases, and whatnot. And that's where the term land race cereals come from. So ancient grains, seven to 10,000 years. The heritage or land race grains date from the sort of 1400s to pre-Green Revolution, 1920s, 1930s. And at that point, there was a huge change in agriculture and we really started breeding what is now the modern semi-dwarf wheat. So the yields went through the roof. Um, the collapse of the family farm means we didn't really need the straw, which was used for animal beddings. So the straw has been bred down a little bit shorter. It now takes a lot more fertilizer. The yields have gone through the roof, but with increased fertilizer, the heads are bigger. So the closer to the ground, the shorter it is, the less likely it is to fall over. So we've decreased our lodging. And it's another whole sort of category of grains, if you will, the modern semi-dwarf ones. Um, any questions about the agronomy? Yes? I just bought some flour in there. Yes. So what kind of that? That would be red fife. So it would be a hard red spring wheat. 
and the protein last year would have been last year's vintage. We haven't lab tested this year's yet, so it'll be about 15.8 percent protein. So perfect for bacon bread. But feel free to mix it with a little bit of like a yeah. commercial white. It, 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 if it's your first time, there's a good chance you're going to make concrete. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good, okay, it makes great toast. I mean, I've fought for years making concrete. It's a tough thing to get the gloom. And the longer the rise, like a, a, even a two day or three day, it's really geared towards the sourdough. So the longer it sits, the softer the bran. And ultimately it's the bran. So the gloom is what gives your bread crumb. And as the yeast metabolizes, it gives off carbon dioxide, which makes your bread rise. And the more air pockets, but often that gliding strand, the protein, gets hit with a piece of bran, and the bran cuts it. And deflates. So your bread is rising, but it's deflating as fast as it's rising. So the stones um, are original. They're French burr stones, so they're a water quartz from the south of France, 1700s. They were apparently the early, early ones were whole pieces, and when they ran out of that, they started going back to get the smaller chunks. Um, they were brought over as ballast in ships and then formed and fitted here once they got here. There's two stones here. There's the bottom stone, which is called the bed stone, and it's going to stay still. But the top stone is going to be doing the spinning. It will run about 90 RPM. Um, you've probably heard the term cold stone ground flour. So the, the cold is a temperature issue that has anything above like 6, 80, 86, I think it is, 78, somewhere in there. The heat will actually denature, will unwrap the bread proteins and make your bread A be less nutrient, so it'll, it'll oxidize the amino acids and, and, um, and vitamins off. But as the proteins denature, your flour will have a greater propensity to go rancid. So the modern flours are milled in a high-speed steel mill that gets very, very hot. So it gets cooled down after that, but then there are anti-rancidity agents and stabilizing agents and emulsifying agents. And there's 37 allowable chemicals in the Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, flour, allowable flour additives. Some of that's a reflection of the agronomy and some of it's a reflection of our milling. But we are cold stone ground, so the, the, the flour rarely gets warm to the touch. So it's going to go down through the middle there. Uh, it's just about as simple as you can possibly imagine. There are the metal rods here, and as this moves, shakes that, just like putting ice and sugar on your crates. As simple as that. This piece of string determines the angle, and the angle determines the rate of flow. And that screw there is the um, mechanism that raises and lowers the stone. So it's not quite one to one. The other end of that is where we're in this corner. So as we raise and lower this one full revolution, which is half a centimeter, the middle stone will raise and lower a quarter centimeter. So a tiny adjustment can get it down to you know, thousands of an inch. So the grain will go down through the middle. It'll rotate through the outside to the skirt. It's a lot of sexist terms um, in milling. In this day, is the skirt. The, the, the stone has a bosom on the inside, and it's a slight deformation on the inside. So as the grain goes in, rather than smearing and shredding the grain, it literally cuts it. So it's cutting the grain in half and half and half. And as it moves to the outside, it gets finer and finer and finer. And then it'll go out the bottom here, to the side, into the basement. These two tubes here are called bucket elevators. This is the downside, as you can see, and it's just like little kids' hands. So as the grain goes into the basement, the bucket elevator would scoop it up, take it all the way up, and in the day it would go to a, a, a cooling floor and then come down to a, a sifter, a bolter, which would separate the whole grain flour into a super fine, a fine, a middlings, which is sort of your cream of wheat, the so protein, and then bran out the back end of it, so five grains. it all the way up and bypass it and bring it right back down the chute as whole grain flour. So it's whole wheat is actually a trademark and it doesn't need to be 100% of the grain. But what we make here is 100%. So every kilogram in is a kilogram out. Um, the rule of thumb, so it's, yes. 
What, what's the minimum clearance between the two stones? Well, until they touch. Well, I'm just going to say, if you, if you smell, if you've ever got to show you, <laughs> which is the bad thing because you're losing the sharpness. Yeah. And it's been, I think, three years, four years since we've dressed them. So that's one of those winches' job is to pull them apart and, and dress them with an old a, a, a pick. So the gizmo in the corner there is in fact a crane, believe it or not. And there are two holes in the side of the upper millstone. And we simply put these in the side. Then those two arms come over and you grab it like a girdle. And you simply screw that screw and it will lift up 11, 1200 pounds. It makes an awful racket, creepy wood. <coughs> but it's very functional. Removing the skirt from the millstone. pressure between the stones to produce fine flour. Yep. The idea is to make the line as straight as possible. No good when you have a few drinks before. Um, if the stones do get too close, if you've ever split wood and you miss and your axe hits a piece of granite and you get that weird magnesium metallic smell, that's bad. That's one thing I try to avoid. Um, we'll get it around so it's 80%. It takes about 5 to 8 kilos to fill all the nooks and crannies. And we'll wait and we'll start getting flour up the back end, you can see it in the cobwebs and whatnot. And then we'll switch bags and we'll move to the food grade. Um, there is a rule of thumb. Um, the index finger and your thumb are very, very sensitive. So before we get to our final tuning, I'll give you a chance to touch the flower so you can feel the coarseness. And literally a, a, a sixteenth of a turn on the wheel will be just enough to, to bring out the flower. Um, yeah, uh, the, the grain's organic. We're a certified organic farm. And because I'm the only miller here and it's my grain, we also certify the mill as a processing plant. So it's under the Canadian certification regime with the food inspection agency. Okay. Any questions? It'll be really, really sexy for like 12 minutes, and then once it's running, it's just boring. <laughs> Not boring, but it's steady state, you know? Peak production, how often would you have to dress the stones? Well, I, th I think annually. So there were itinerant stone dressers that would come around, and there is the express and show me your metal. And, and stone dressers would actually have metal fragments in their arms, and the, the logic was the more stone fragments, the more experienced you are. Okay. It's really a measure of the, of the smith who would temper the picks, and the more brittle the pick, the greater the probability of having a stone in your arm. So you may have a bad smith and not necessarily be a good stone dresser. But a annually, I think, was a, a reasonable rule of thumb. The water is for demonstrative purposes only. It would have been a brush shop wheel. Um, Upper Beverly Lake is now cottage country, and there would be some pits that they came for holiday and came to a mud flat. So we run it off electricity. Also, when the mill was abandoned, the government, uh, M&R, took back the water rights. So, so, yeah, we're electricity now, but this is the way it would have been. And eventually moved to a turbine, which is much more efficient. This relies on water drop, 
It'd be a very carry to five gallon pail of water, up to seven feet. That would be the force of one bucket of water, whereas the turbine ran on water flow. So it was much more efficient. a lubricant and if it gets too warm the only thing we can do is either put less wheat in or raise the stone to make a coarser grind. Some of the, that protein and the dryness will be effective in each vintage, so each year will be slightly different.